Shall we get started? Uh, so welcome everybody. Thank you for coming. This is our I lost track of third, third or fourth um, SRS series, and we are pleased to welcome soon to be Dr. Patrick Jones. So take it away. Um, thank you all for coming today. Um, the title of my talk is a bit confusing. It's called Elections as Conversations, Electronic Voting Technologies, Digital Democracy, and the Socio-Technical Imaginary. But in reality, that's just a lie. It's a, <laughs> it's a dissertation in progress talk about my dissertation, which is titled Delivering Democracy, the History and Deployment of Electronic Voting Technologies in India and the United States. Um, and so I want to start by just giving a kind of overall description of the project. Electronic voting technologies are a ubiquitous feature of elections around the world but have received little attention from scholars as either a form of political engagement or medium of political communication. Instead, scholarly discussion of ETs is seen or used in terms of their positive or negative effects on the democratic process. In this debate, opponents argue that EVTs play an important role in increasing voter enfranchisement and democratic participation. In India, for example, over 550 million people used EVTs to vote in the country's 16th general elections in May 2014, making it the largest democratic exercise in history. However, others contend that the ease with which EVTs can be manipulated presents unparalleled opportunities to subvert the electoral process. In the most recent US presidential election, for example, possible interference by Russian hackers has forced many to ask deeply unsettling questions about the legitimacy of the election's results. Rather than negotiate a truce between these two polarized positions, my dissertation argues that the tensions of such a debate and not its resolution are essential to understanding the relationship between technology and democracy in an era of political processes of indigenous. The project represents one of the first critical inquiries into how electronic voting technologies or EVTs shape electoral processes in the 21st century in the world's largest and world's oldest democracies. Using archival research, interviews, and participant observation, I historicized the emergence of electronic voting technology in the United States and India and mobilized them to elaborate the intersection of material features, economic processes, administrative procedures, and legal frameworks that configure elections as political technologies. Sympathetic with literature and political communication and social movement theory that sees digital technology as playing a constitutive role in political action, I argue that EVTs and the expertise needed to maintain, repair, and innovate them, as well as the knowledge needed to administer elections, uh, work together to articulate a conception of democracy grounded in social and technical practice. Mobilizing EVTs in this way effectively opens the black box of electoral democracy, allowing it to emerge as a technology in its own right, one not defined simply by its inputs, votes, and its outputs, electoral outcomes. The portrait of EVTs depicted in my project complicates the traditional maxim that elections must be free and fair. Engaging contemporary election controversies in each country and look at the ways that EVTs are rhetorically connected to public trust and electoral processes and how these connections are materially, legally, and administratively linked potential types of electoral reforms. Positioning EVTs as a mediator between electoral processes and the public's confidence in those processes, I contend that they are a distinct form of new media, one that reminds us that electoral democracy doesn't end at the ballot box. Instead, I argue that EVTs render a person's vote an active political communication capable of linking the individual experience of democracy to other actors entangled in the electoral process. Transforming the act of voting into an act of communication provides a framework for theorizing how contemporary electoral processes configure, control, and problematize the figure of the voter in the 21st century. Rather than use the project's comparative framework to evaluate each country's electoral processes against the other, the project aims to dismantle the idea that a consistent concept of democracy grounded in social and technical practices coheres between either country. Instead, the project culminates by investigating how each country's distinct approach to election management and the use of electronic voting technologies collides in global spaces, creating both a market for electronic voting technologies and other democratic commodities and a global practice of democracy conceptualized as a socio-technical system. The project emerges out of an interdisciplinary set of literatures, including science and technology studies, media and technology studies, political communications, and crit uh, critical historiography. Um, the view, the commonality between each of these literatures is the view that technologies play a constitutive role in our social, political, cultural, economic, and communicative lives. This view disrupts the polarizing views of technological determinists who see technology as a natural progressive historical force, and those who see the effects of technology as essentially reducible to the intentions of those who use them. Instead, understanding technological actors as material participants in a hyper-media environment that both shape and are shaped by that environment 
provide few analytical sites into the composition of our everyday social, political, cultural, and economic milieus. The view of technology, this view of technology provides the analytical framework for exploring the intersection of material features, economic processes, administrative procedures, and legal frameworks that allows elections to be articulated as a socio-technical system. Our concession of that socio-technical system follows from Thomas Hughes' method of using technical artifacts to map larger technological systems. And I quote, news, an artifact, either physical or non-physical, functioning as a component in a system, interacts with other artifacts, all of which contribute directly to or directly or through other components of the common system goal. If a component is removed from a system or if its characteristics change, the other artifacts of the system will alter characteristics accordingly, end quote. I argue that these socio-technical systems act as the conditions of possibility for contemporary debates on the use of electronic voting technologies. They do this in three ways. First, contemporary controversies centered around electronic voting. First, sorry, excuse me. First, contemporary controversies center on the use of electronic voting technologies emerge out of specific socio-technical configurations. Second, attempts to close said controversies are shaded by the possibilities afforded through those systems. And third, attempts at closure reconfigure relationships within a specific socio-technical system, creating new problems, which in turn seem to stir new controversies. In order to trace the emergence and articulation of these socio-technical systems in both Indian, the Indian, and American political context, I asked three interrelated research questions. What problems animated the emergence and innovation of in these in each country? What are the economic, legal, administrative, and other material processes connecting the production, design, and distribution of UTs to other public social groups interested in electoral outcomes? And who, how do the socio-technical systems that emerge and answer the previous two questions configure contemporary moments of controversy and closure? Together, these questions examine the various problems, such as voter participation and corruption, to which EUTs are in response, the ways EUTs have historically shaped administrative and legal solutions to these problems, and the new problems which result in the use of EUTs. Before proceeding, I want to talk a little bit about what exactly electronic voting technologies are. Um, sort of in the literature on electronic voting technologies, there's basically three sort of broad defin three definitions. Um, one is sort of one that doesn't recognize any difference between um, electronic and non-electronic voting technology. In this in essence, anything that allows you to vote as a technology. So in a paper and voice voting, internet voting, and uh, direct recording equipment are all the same. Second sort of definition more narrowly or really narrowly defines electronic voting technology is anything in which the input is electronic. Um, and the third definition focuses on not inputs, but outputs. So how are the votes counted? How are they counted? Um, my definition embraces this third view, mainly because it A, gives us that flexibility that the first view gives us about what we regard as technology by focusing on things that are counted electronically. Um, so you can still have paper votes that are then counted electronically in that view. Um, it also gives us a little bit more room to look at the sort of the historical ways in which older technologies have configured contemporary um, electoral context. So for example, mechanical lever voting in the United States has played a huge role in the way that sort of the trajectory of development of electronic, digital electronic voting technology in the United States. Um, and what you see up here is different pictures of the different kinds of technology. So over here is a DRE, a Digital Direct Recording Electric, uh, yeah, Direct Recording Equipment voting machine. This is no longer made. Not very many people use these now anymore. They're rapidly being taken away. Digital was subject to much controversy back the thousands. This is an optical scan ballot. This is something that counts an optical scan ballot. Um, so it's basically a non-standardized, like standardized test. And then over here is the sort of breakdown that was hanging Chad, which is sort of the punch card technology that sort of, in the wake of the Bush Gore debacle and the passage of the Help America Vote Act. To push an optical scan, I mean, not optical scan, punch card technology out. Um, and we we'll talk a little bit more about those things at the beginning of the question period. Um, I kind of want to start the actual cases by talking a little bit about the United States case. The majority of the talk today is going to focus on India. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the US system because the differences from the Indian system are stark. Um, so I want to start with a quote from Pippa Norris. He was a very famous commentator on sort of electron or electoral trans transparency. Um, does a lot of work for the UN. Um, she recently presented a paper at the American Association of Political Science Conference, and this is what she had to say about the US electoral system. Quote, the, con the contested US president presidential election of 2000 brought the world's attention to the fact that state and local governments in the United States built significant control over the conduct of federal elections. Gap in state election laws requiring on the fly interpretation, state and local management of registration lists and polling places, country by country or even precinct by precinct variations in voting technologies, ballot designs, voter instructions, and the vote counting and vote counting standards 
dispute adjudication by a dizzying array of state actors, including courts, and possibly the Florida state legislature. Each node of state and local control in the context of a close election seemed to have some potential to make, make the choice in the next presidential election in the whole nation. Well, this is Kevin Norris sort of dissecting the context of the 2000, the post 2000 land, election landscape. Remember, this paper was given two months, three months ago at AFSA, and it was about contemporary elections. So, in the 17 years since then, not much has changed in this election sort of choreography. Um, and we can talk a little about the failures of what they tried to do to implement. But while Kevin Norris's quote captures the role decentralization plays, into, plays in US election problems, it also fails to take into account the degree in which to which the privatization of US electoral infrastructure also contributes to these problems. VR systems of a, an electoral registration provider whose systems were compromised by Russian hackers prior to the election, the 2016 US presidential election, demonstrates the important role the private companies play in US electoral processes. And then I think to appreciation of the privatized nature of American voting technology really sharpens the sort of almost mesmerizing impenetrability of the contemporary US election system. And I think it is this impenetrability, this confusion, that profoundly shapes the debate around both the U.S., both the use of electronic voting machines in this country, as well as the overall security of the electoral process. Um, I'm not going to have like, much time to talk about the U.S. here, and I'm happy to take questions about it. But I want to end with this quote that sort of brings from a, from a recent New York Times article that brings both these aspects together, sort of the decentralization and the privatization problem. Um, and this is about the 2016 election. Quote, after a presidential campaign scarred by Russian meddling, uh, meddling, local, state, federal agencies have conducted little of the type of digital forensic investigation required to assess the impact, if any, on voting in at least 21 states whose election systems were targeted by Russian hackers. According to interviews with nearly two dozen national security and state officials and election technology specialists, the assaults on the vast back end election apparatus, voter registration operations, state and local election databases, e poll books, and other equipment have received far less attention than other aspects of the Russian interference, such as the hacking of democratic emails and spreading of false or damaging information by Hillary Clinton. Government officials said that they intentionally did not address the security and back end election systems, whose disruption could prevent voters from even casting ballots. That's partly because states control elections. They have fewer resources than the federal government and have long been loath to allow even cursory federal intrusions into the voting process. But this even more clearly on the act, like on the eve of the 2016 election, when Russian penetration of state and local election offices in a variety of states had become clear. The Secretary of State of Georgia, I'm paraphrasing, said something like, We don't need the federal government to help protect our election systems from foreign actors speaking about ourselves, which is a fairly insane comment, um, given the resources of one has and the resources of the other has. So I'm going to move on to talking a little bit more about Indian elections, but again, I'm happy to talk about. U.S. elections um, again. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, Indian elections are massive. There are 550 million people voted in the election in 2014. After out, out of a polity of about 850 million, give or take, um, there were 935,000 polling booths used that could basically take on a maximum of 2,000 voters each. They're positioned two kilometers away from each other, so everybody can theoretically get to a polling booth pretty easily. They use 1.7 electronic voting machines approximately 11 million electoral workers, they still have 66% turnout. Um, so one of the things that sort of, in the sort of, in sort of the Indian electoral discussion that makes this possible is the existence of a federal system of election management. So the Election Commission of Indi India is a centralized constitutionally mandated election authority that basically runs um, federal and, and sort of state legislative assembly elections. There are small, there are local elections in India that aren't done under, done under the auspices of the Electoral Commission, but we'll leave those out for right now. They're very important, but we'll leave out right now. Um, and I would say that sort of the Election Commission sort of emphasizes two things in their approach to election management. One is sort of at least a rhetoric of transparent, transparency, openness, and demonstration to the public. And the other is universal adult franchise, right? That everybody can do. These are really pivot points in their rhetoric about how they manage elections. We'll come back to them here. By how they operationalize them in this sort of election context. So I want to start by just saying a little bit about what EVMs exactly are. Um, so this on the left is basically the entirety of an EVM. On the left, you see uh, the control unit that counts the votes. On the right, you see the ballot unit where you input the votes. In between them, you see the 15-meter cable that connects them. Um, that allows them to talk to one another. Over here, you see four ballots connected to one unit. So theoretically, you can have up to 64 candidates. 
um, not in one election. It's not really the case anymore. You have 60 or well, about 63, um, because one of these will have another of the above option on it now. Also, they have toy technology that can theoretically link another six, like, I'm not going to do that right now, 10 of these, so they can have a 384 candidates or so. Um, although, there's sketchy details about how much those have been used. And then on the right, you just get a, a sense of the simplicity of the interface, because it's really important. So you have the symbol, political party name, and then a button. That's it, pretty much, right? So you just can basically, that's it. So it all runs on symbols. Um, EVMs EV emerged in India in the late 70s. Actually, 1977, they began, as, um, they began designing EVMs. And they kind of emerged in response to a specific set of problems. One was a high price of paper on international market that was making running elections very expensive. Um, issues of disenfranchisement, basically political parties and other actors exploiting um, sort of outdated election infrastructure, um, disenfranchised voters, other forms of political corruption, voter intimidation, what's called booth capture, which is the armed takeover of voting booths. Um, and then those armed groups will put manually stuff ballot boxes and also severely slow counts. So the need for fast counts was a major thing that was necessary. Um, it takes about up to five months to get a count. You can imagine the length of that process is problematic. Um, for the purposes of this talk, I'm not going to go in to the long history between 1977 and 1998 when EVMs were actually implemented. Um, EVMs were first tested in India in 1982, um, but due to legal maneuverings by political by opposite by certain kind of certain political parties. Um, the development of legal infrastructure to have EVMs um, and a variety of other factors, EVMs didn't roll out until 1998. I'm also happy to answer questions about that period in the question answer period. Um, needless to say, beginning in 1998, with, with the general elections of 1998, uh, they began this phase rollout of uh, EVMs. And basically, between, EV, between 1988, 1998 and 2004, in those six years, EVMs went from being something tested to the standard technology used in the fall in federal and state Indian elections. And just give you, take a second to let you think about that. That's a lot, that's insane. Like that's a crazy engineering project, right? Um, at the same time they were doing this, they also techno fully technologized almost every other aspect of their election. So they computerized electoral rolls during this time. They issued standard voter ID cards to people, um, not yet quite photo ID cards that came 2004 after, but the idea was already there. Um, they developed a, a, a centralized network communications infrastructure between um, the Federal Election Commission and the state bodies, um, and they increased the amount of sort of digital surveillance uh, and that and monitoring techniques to sort of observe uh, electronic voting machines. Um, I want to say something really quickly, and we can talk about this again also in the questions. Um, voter ID cards are really interesting sort of so different history of voter ID cards in India from the United States. So the United States has deeply racialized technology, and in India, sort of the way their position is this deeply enfranchising one, um, which is an interesting sort of way of thinking about the different sort of socio-technical cultural aspects of technology. But um, so I want to talk a little bit more about the design of EVMs. Um, they have what's called a simple embedded design. Essentially, what you saw in that picture is pretty much it. Um, they have a microcontroller that has one time programmed software burned onto it. I mean, software can't be altered once it's burned onto the microcontroller. Um, and this is sort of the simple design is really important to their um, overall utility in the elections. For um, the election commission, it makes them very hard to manipulate because it's very easy to understand architecture that's protected by its simplicity. They often describe EVMs as big calculators rather than as like, digital technologies. Um, it's battery powered, so it can go out from rural areas, it can get to other people that more normally be able to get to it, and it's very simple to use. Um, it's manufactured by two companies, two public service undertakings in India, of our Electronics uh, Limited and Electronics Corporation Limited, but actually the software is burned on the microcontrollers by two foreign companies, Renaissance Japan and Microchips USA, um, which I think their plant is actually just outside of Portland. Um, that's probably going to change in the next few years. but. That's sort of like the design elements is this simplicity is important to security, um, mainly because you can't alter the software. I don't want to make it sound like EVMs are the only actor in Indian elections, though. That's not obviously the case. Um, they're not even really, they're not saying the most important actor. Um, I think all of these other actors are very important. I want to take a minute to talk a little bit more about the Election Commission of India specifically. So, again, the Election Commission of India is a constitutionally mandated authority that began operating in 1950. 
and they're explicitly tasked with managing electoral roles and registration and holding elections. And the Election Commission in India was designed sort of during constituent assembly debates in India as the Constitution was being written to be this agency that was empowered to do this outside the auspices of the normal government. Um, gradually over time, um, Election Commission during periods of different, different activisms, most particularly in the early 90s, um, has expanded, has used the sort of core responsibilities that it's tasked with to expand its role. Um, one of the, I want to talk just quickly about two of them. Um, one is through the establishment of what's called what's an electoral temporality, which is basically when the Election Commission of India calls an election, different laws go into effect. Basically, the Election Commission of India becomes a superseding legal authority in India. Now, they can't prosecute people, but they can hold people accountable, and then prosecutions are going to take it after the end of the elections. But they have super legal authority. Um, this has led to a vast literature on Indian elections to discuss the sort of electoral temporality. It's really interesting. And the second is like tools of party discipline. So political parties, as we'll see a little bit in a few minutes, are, uh, are probably one of the more intense oppositional actors, particularly the EVMs, and sort of the expansion of the election commission's activities, um, for reasons I'm guessing you can all imagine. One of the other technologies is something called model of code of conduct. And model of code of conduct doesn't just exist for political parties, it also exists for other actors. Um, the model code of conduct basically lays out how political parties can behave during elections and they can act on. So, for example, you can't um, campaign two days before an election, right? Um, they tried to, they tried to uh, the election commission actually a few years ago tried to leverage um, uh, the model code of conduct to um, ban exit polling, for example. They failed, but, um, which is another interesting topic. Um, and then there's all these other actors that are involved, and I think we all assume would be interested in the electoral process. I want to just highlight two, um, is to read one, bring it back to sort of, these companies that make EVMs are really important, um, in addition to political parties, but also I just want to highlight the voters are really important. So, um, as we kind of move into this idea of this sort of socio-technical architecture that sort of emerges out of this, it causes rearrange, the sort of technologization of Indian election rearranges, um, sort of socio-technical composition of Indian electoral processes. And in doing so, it reconfigures the voter in that process, and reconfigures the role of political parties, and whether it actually affects change in the way the election commission intended isn't really the point, it's just there's change, right? There's really serious shifts. Um, so on the more socio side of things, you have this massive media education and outreach projects that accompanies the sort of, the use of all these different voting technologies. Um, and the media becomes a real outlier for the election commission in sort of teaching citizens how to vote, right? How to have them use these machines. Um, they also become a tool for um, what's called SPEAK, which is the voter education prospect, process, and there's a massive outreach um, to voters to teach them how to vote. A lot of this sort of works around demonstrations, like public demonstrations, I mentioned that earlier, of showing people how these machines work, like the cast votes. I wanna highlight something here it's sort of an emerging element of my argument. They're not just teaching people how to vote. They're creating confidence in the voting process. So one of the major problems with the use of electronic voting te technologies, particularly ones where votes are inputted electronically, is that people get very, uh, when they can't see where the vote goes, they can't have that paper thing at the end, it becomes a problem of trust, right? So this is definitely a, a very much a targeted outreach. Um, there's also the sort of definition of disciplinary mechanisms for political parties, and I'm just going to be a little bit up in the air about this one, because um, I think it's a little bit more of a sort of a relationship issue. Um, I think one of the things you can argue is that the technologization of Indian elections allowed the election commissioner, commissioner to reconfigure its relationship with the voter, and that had significant effects with how political parties interacted with voters. Um, the effects of the far reaching effects of that are unclear or non existent, but it's an interesting problem. Um, on the technical side, there's a whole new set of infrastructural processes that emerge to deal with EVMs and other voting technologies. There's new chains of custody that have to be elaborated, sort of top, top to tail, um, walk, like monitoring and surveillance of electronic voting machines at every stage of the process. This map here, basically, which you can't see very well, I apologize, is sort of details how machines are distributed, and this notion of randomization. So at each level of machine distribution for a particular election, there's an element of randomization. So when an election is called and EVMs are sent to the states, they're randomly sent to different states. So when the states send them to districts, they're randomly sent to districts. When they're sent to constituencies, they're randomly sent to constituencies. And the final act of randomization is when 
political party lists for individual elections comes out, those are randomized too, and they come out a day before the election usually. Um, and so chain of custody randomization accompanies this massive surveillance and monitoring exercise that requires these, uh, these storage room where EVMs are, are, are kept are monitored all the time. They're live monitored. Um, and so both these things work together to sort of recompose the Indian election. Um, it's not just that EVMs come in and people have a new right? It's a whole remodeling of what Indian elections look like based on the introduction of all these technologies, not just EVMs. So over the last uh, 13 years, um, actually by within like six or seven years since I've been working so closely with Islam, um, you really had um, this Indian approach to electronic election management congeal. Um, and so I wanted to read a couple quotes. After the 2014 election, the Election Commission declared EVMs the lay motif of the world's largest democratic exercise, the smarter than avatar. Hillary Clinton in 2011 said India's Election Commission is widely viewed as the global gold standard for running elections as already sharing best practices with counterparts in other countries, including Iraq and Iran, uh, or kind of Iraq and Egypt. Um, and I also want to read just one more quote really quickly from a former election commissioner, S.Y. Qureshi, who has been really deeply responsible for the internationalization of Indian election management. Um, quote, Indian elections are a brand, which has, got, which has great respect worldwide. Every week we get a delegation from some country or the other. They want to know our secret, our magic. We do not have any magic. We just have a very good foundation laid by the constitutional framers and built on by legislation with supported political parties. You know the sheer size of our elections. We have more voters than in all 50 countries of Europe put together, plus in all 20 countries of South America put together, and the complexity of these 70 countries all rolled together into one. We have tensions, conflicts, election frauds, militancy, everything rolled into one. When we conduct elections smoothly and declare the results in 12 hours, it's a marvel. We are doing lots of things with our neighboring countries. Bhutan, for instance, is a new democracy, and they have chosen the Indian model after considering several options. They used our machines, they used our technology, our system. Nepal used our machines and procedures also. We have been consulted by Egypt and Kenya. We have decided to share our experiences with emerging democracies. We are setting up an institute called the India International Institute of Democracy and Election Management. And the very first course for the Kenyan trainees is starting at the end of June of this year, which is 2011. Now they have a bigger campus that's been built by this massive international campus for this exact project. Um, and this isn't to say these are the only perspectives. This is just to show that this sort of architecture that I kind of briefly laid out has congealed into this thing, this object. Um, there's obviously a lot of differences, you know, differences of opinion on sort of what happens in electronic voting machines. So both these quotes are from the most recent legislative assembly elections earlier this year. Um, once Margaret Kurzweil, who sort of helped with this demonstration hack very back in May, I think, or maybe April, um, he said, it's dangerous to make democracy in a country, speaking about EVMs, and people should raise their voices against them. The ECI can give us its machines, we will show how to hack it in 90 seconds by merely changing its mother board. This is my wealthy uh, head of the BSP. People's trust in EVMs is broken. The BJP has tampered with EVMs in Uttar Pradesh. I have written the election commission in this regard. People no more have faith in the EVM machines. It is an attack on democracy. Whatever reports I am getting my sources from in many areas, people are where people have not been living with BAP, the party is emerging as a winner. And all I really want to say about these two sides of this debate, because I think both these quotes kind of capture these positive and negative elements, is that I think if you study technology, you're familiar with these kinds of terms, right? Technology will either save us or will change us, right? And there's going to be all sorts of name calling and sort of problems that arise out of that argument. What I want to use is sort of try and briefly and sort of anecdotally a little bit show you uh, that actually it helps us understand a rhetorical battle a little bit better if we take into example and take into effect what the sort of socio-technical architecture is. Um, as I said earlier, a lot of EVMs further sort of crystallized what I would consider to be a sort of uh, like a, a relationship of animosity between political parties and um, the election commission. And usually this animosity turns around one key term, which is tamper proof. EVMs are tamper-proof, the ECI always says. Um, and whatever anybody, as you saw in that other quote, says that, when the ECI says that, they go, it's not tamper-proof, we'll show you how they're not tamper-proof. And invariably, how they're not tamper-proof is through demonstration hacks. I take your machine, I'm gonna show you that I can switch out the motherboard, and then it'll run out, run how I want to do it. I can show you that if I have access to it, I can clip, blue, clip some Bluetooth technology onto it, and then I can alter it from sitting outside. That's what tamper-proof means. All you have to do is, is show machine vulnerability, 
right? And once you show vulnerability, the potentiality is real. Like the threat is that's all you need. Um, there's a space between that and what the ECI means when they say tamper. The ECI says tamper proof, they are referring to the simple embedded design, right? That's part of a, a massive redundant exercise of security. They're also referring to those chains of custody I mentioned. It's elaborate administrative and technical infrastructure that for them is impossible to hack. Um, surveillance, steel, storage, every step of the way, these public administrations that test the machines. And for the ECI, that's what you have to hack. You have to hack the process, not the machine. That's why as a, um, as a, a former election committee commission official, in India told me when I, when I was talking with them, it take a thousand James Bonds to sufficiently hack the entire Indian election. <laughs> um, what's interesting about these debates is that they've yielded actual results, right? So I don't want to talk about all these, but I really want to talk about is just the voter verified paper audit trail. Um, voter verified paper audit trail is an innovation in Indian voting machines that will produce a paper slip after someone votes. That slip will dangle for a second so you can see that it matched who you vote for, and then drop into a lockbox, creating the idea that after the election, if things were bad, you could actually go back and audit it. Voter verified paper trail innovation precedes this latest round of elections, but the speeding up of their production by the latest controversies is what I'm interested in, is that the debate I just showed you, the tamper-proof debate, is really what sort of allowed the VV, VV, VV Pat to emerge as a solution to the problem, right? The problem isn't sort of this end-all, be-all thing. It's that here's the reform. Now, when this reform's introduced, and I was talking with somebody about this very recently, um, it's going to complicate that chain of custody. All of a sudden, you got another machine you got to take, right? It's going to obscure the need for other urgent electoral reforms, right? It's going to obscure the need, particularly for if you're familiar with the electoral reform in India, financial reform is the biggest one, right? Like that's a really big problem. Um, and it also potentially uh, reinforces the power of political parties to a degree it creates space. Um, so I'll just conclude here um, with a couple slides sort of trying to bring my argument together. I'll return to the US view to do that. In May of 2015, the National Security Watchdog website, Intercept, published a top secret national security document detailing Russia's interference in the 2016 election. According to the report, Russian hackers targeted the electoral infrastructures of 39 states as well as third-party electoral support services. The attacks attempted to compromise electoral registration systems in order to disrupt voting processes on election day. The revelations confirmed previous reports of Russian hackers targeting state electoral offices in Florida and Illinois, and others. The Intercept's leak and ongoing congressional investigations position the U.S. electronic election infrastructure at the center of concerns about the integrity of U.S. elections. As Kenneth Greer, an ambassador to NATO's Cyber Center, stated, the publication, the publication of the report, we were, uh, sorry. after the publication of the report, we were all kind of, quote, we were all kind of hoping that election hacking was at the cognitive level. Propaganda, dokes, you know, influence, influence operations. But this is proof that they were actually closer to the tactical, technical level. They were closer to the guts, the operating system of our democracy than we knew. The cognitive attacks in, that Rear mentions refer to the strong suspicion in the intelligence community that Russian hackers were obviously behind the DNC hacks that rocked the U.S. presidential campaign in the summer and fall of 2016. The systemic and broad-based nature of Russian incursion has reunited debates about the role of technology in U.S. elections, as well as the structure and design of U.S. elections that undermine public confidence in the process we call. Controversies like the ongoing investigation into Russian interference in the 2016 presidential U.S. election and a perpetual debate around EVM tampering in India highlights the ways in which socio-technical architecture, architectures produce rhetorical discourses and problematics concerning the use of electronic voting technology to configure potential solutions. In the U.S., election security experts, the media, legislators of both the state and federal levels, think tanks, academics, and a massive, decentralized, and cohate electoral bureaucracy which manages U.S. elections have used the threat of foreign interference to reinvigorate discussions about the security of U.S. election processes which were originally animated by the bush Gore debacle and subsequent passage of the Health and Act. This time, the stakes of the debate, which were already very high, have been raised further by the Mueller investigation. At the heart of these debates is a profound lack of clarity about what the problems facing the U.S. election management even are. Does a highly decentralized um, electoral system, effectively 50 different electoral systems, and those can vary on county level, make it easier or harder to secure a U.S. election infrastructure? What role should technology play in the election process? We want to carve out a coherent role for the federal government to play in election oversight. Can we develop general security standards and protocols that would easily graph on the 50 different electoral systems? 
How do you develop a regulatory framework for the voting technology industry that actually has teeth? In India, political parties, civil society organizations, the media, the election commission, the government of India are using EVMs as the focal point of a multifaceted debate about electoral reform. This debate uses EVMs as a means of focusing on how the election commission manages the election process, specifically the administrative and technical apparatus used to protect EVMs both during and after elections, how the EC disciplines and controls the game of political parties, and the role of corruption in Indian electoral life. Centralized control of Indian elections affords the debate around EVMs a coherence that highlights the degree which the electoral process and its associated technology are conceived of, managed, and maintained as a kind of technical system in India. While some might cast doubt on the integrity of the technology, the Election Commission responds by situating EVMs in an elaborate set of administrative and technical protocols that would seem to render some quotidian reforms acting even more possible. And I'll just conclude with this as sort of what I'm like conceptualizing and working on right now. Um, Despite, the despite their differences, both India and the United States see elections as a vital political technology. One that ensures the smooth, stable transition of power, legitimates authority, and involves the citizenry in political life. For democratic theorists, these three goals are often summed up in the aspiration for, quote, free and fair, free and fair elections. This double articulation of elections is both democratic ideal and political technology. Highlight one of the central paradoxes of the free and fair mantra. Elections are designed to be free in the sense that a person has the right to cast their vote for whoever they choose without fear, threat, or intimidation. This sense of freedom is materially enacted through the use of secret and secret ballot, for example. However, this emphasis on freedom does not necessarily play well with the desire for fairness. To make elections fair, one needs transparency, redundancy, and repeatability. Without a host of, without a host of observational and auditing technologies, the security of elections can never be guaranteed. To successfully negotiate the need for transparency alongside a commitment to secrecy, Election, field, election officials need the confidence of the electorate. The problematization of electronic voting technology therefore effectively materializes public trust, highlighting the dissonance between actual election processes and concerns about their possible voting right. Thank you. So take us back to, you don't need to actually go back to this, but you know, you, your initial slide um, offered up some theoretical directions in science technology studies, I'm forgetting the second one, and then political communication. So if you were to kind of, now we're at this end point, and you started this at this beginning point, how would you connect those two more directly in terms of how does this speak back to the theory and in, term, in, in turn, how does that theory now, how does it help you have to get to this this conclusion. Um, I think there are sort of three ways. One is methodological. I think that science and technology studies is sort of methods of sort of trying to materially trace the composition of these like socio-technical environments speaks really fits really well with the current political communication work. Shadow to some extent, but I would also think that uh Secret Berg and Fence work on connective action. Um, and some of David Carr's work and David Heiss's work as well. I've sort of also seen um, that kind of method yield good results for kind of critically redescribing electoral processes. As far as the sort of, especially this last slide that I was discussing, the free and fair part um, and then the public confidence part, that's less clear to me um, in an explicit way. So this is what I'm thinking about right now, but I'll, I'll try and I'll favor a guess. Um, I think it's really interesting to start to think about the object of elections is not being electoral outcomes, but being as the configuration of public trust, which is in and of itself a socio-technical object. And now referring back to more someone like Chadwick's work, I think that meets really well in a discipline like political communication, where goals, agendas um, are often configured as the output of these sort of ecologies that are tracked and traced. So I think SPS is very methodologically sympathetic. I feel like that's pretty clear, especially in Chadwick's work and other people's as well, Sigurd and Bennett as well. Um, methodologically very sympathetic. But I also think it's an interesting way to start taking an object like public confidence or trust. Um, the way this actually came up is I was having a conversation with uh, another scholar, with another professor in Boston, and he basically said something like, the way I was talking about elections is very similar to the way people talk about journalism, and that journalism needs um, tools like objectivity to cultivate public trust and that it might be helpful to start thinking about elections as a way of cultivating a certain kind of trust as well. Mm -hmm. um, and so 
Yeah, yeah, no, I think so. I mean, it's, I think that's a really intriguing idea, um, especially when you talked about representatives from these other uh, transitional democracies coming to India to try to learn about their, you know, system. You know, you could argue um, that they're trying to understand the technical architecture of those things, but also how that leads to a particular outcome, which is public trust being a, a necessary condition of, for the future of, the, of their democracies, right? In other words, the voting, the voting only matters insofar as people actually trust the outcome of that process. And so um, I, I think that's where that comes through most clearly is when you look at how those other, how other you know, outside stakeholders perceive India's system as kind of being almost a, a means by which to engender both better elections and a great public trust. Yeah, it's very interesting to me. I mean, that sort of, that, I mean, the international level is probably where the project found some of its initial footing because the reality is that when countries want global elections, they don't come looking for U.S. Mm -hmm. technology companies to some extent. Some do. There's mm -hmm. Smartmatics and Nikita one and there are some, but Indian election management is sort of, like they said, the global code standard. Lots of people want it. They are developing a market for it. And um, for me, there's a really, there's an interesting emphasis there about the way, sort of a much larger question, the way that India does democratic work globally and the way the U.S. does old-fashioned, more sort of neo-colonial um, democracy promotion, right? So, like, there's ideals and then there's, like, practices and India does practices <laughs> and the U.S. tries to do ideals and people want the practices. Mm -hmm. So, I think that's another way to show that. So. You know, just another thought, um, and I don't mean to <laughs> take over the, the discussion here, um, you know, I think there's an interesting parallel, but perhaps with some work done on the history of the internet um, by Benjamin Peters. He wrote a book um, about the, the Russian internet and how essentially in the 50s, 60s, 70s, you know, the cybernetics, the Russia and the U.S. were both, or Soviet Union, I guess, and the U.S. were both developing their own versions of the internet. And on the one hand, you had a, a capitalist success capitalist society in the U.S. that actually approached internet building in a fairly centralized, government-driven fashion. Meanwhile, you had a socialist country that actually approached the internet in much more decentralized, um, even capitalistic fashion. And so that, it, those sort of interesting parallels play into then the way those internets developed, um, and of course, which one was eventually adopted more broadly. So I'm just thinking here in terms of talking about how you know different value sets play into different or, you know, technical arrangements um, that maybe there may be some interesting corollaries to draw with other types of network systems, whether the internet, uh, electrical grids, um, other types of public infrastructure. So if you think about voting as a kind of public infrastructure system, there may be some, some ideas and theories from design and infrastructure studies that could be helpful as well. I was wondering, um, when I think of India, Indian society, I think of fragments and stratification. Uh, and so a lot of different groups within society have different level of access to technology. Uh, so a certain minority would not have the same access to, to technology. Uh, or um, women do not have the same kind of access to technology. Um, so how does the social technical aspect, is it, do you think, is it a leveling uh, technology? It's, is it a leveler? I mean, I think they, I mean, I think they might have rhetorically position it as a leveler, for sure. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't mean. I, I, yeah, how does the technology address those fragments and stratifications then? So I think with the voting technology, it's a really interesting problem because Technology is positioned as a leveler that has certainly led to increased voter participation. There are certainly still groups that are kept out of participating in the vote in other ways and other mechanisms, but I don't think these technologies speak too well. I think that question is also interestingly implicated with other elements of this sort of push for a digital India that particularly the BJP has been really interested in. Um, so this idea of creating technological accessibility as an extension of sort of state power um, and state control. Um, and then I think you get this really interesting sort of 
combination of A, what does leveling mean in that context? Like what does participation even mean if A, the terms of that participation are unequal or stratified or hierarchical, but also when they're clearly linked to other projects which have a reification of stratification um, embedded in them. Because I don't think anybody would really want to argue that the BJP's push for digital India is, is designed to make you know, technology accessible for all people. Um, in some sense, it seems like it reifies fragmentation and does a lot of that work as well. Um, so I think it's an interesting, it's an interesting space between the two things, which is sort of the rhetorical goal, obviously, and the actual system. And I think the system seems like it does create the conditions where people can participate. But I also don't want to ever paint a picture with this just like is the magic wand that like allows everybody to vote or have access to this technology. Um, the one way that the election commission is really interesting to sold it is that um, this is a, this is a technology that by the necessity of having people who don't like have access to, to technology vote on it, that this is like a space for technological literacy. Um, but that's that's a little bit weird, right? Um, I don't want to certainly don't want the election commission to emerge as like the hero of the story. Like they're not like <laughs> they are, so yeah, I don't know if that directly answers your question. Um, <laughs> yes. So, 66 percent you said was the turnout in 2014. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, just to contextualize, how does that compare to previous previous years? Um, it's pretty steady. Uh, it goes up and down a little bit, uh, but I'd say between 64 and 67. Actually, I would say the it's a I'd say actually one of the weaknesses right now, the, not the project overall, but the, certainly this talk, is that it unduly focuses on federal elections, um, which actually the real crazy part of the turnout occurs when you think about legislative assembly elections. I mean, they have districts where just essentially just think of it like as people voting for congressional officials, right? Like they have 100% voter turnout in places. They have 90% voter turnout. Um, when we focus on federal turnout numbers, we get a really perverted way of understanding electoral participation. So in the US, I mean, you might have 58% turnout in this presidential election. Let's say you're going to get 30% voter turnout in the same kind of congressional election, maybe. So in different districts, it obviously varies quite a bit. But like that's where the, the participation numbers really kick in for the Indian stuff at that sort of low legislative assembly election. Because the numbers are really good at the federal level. But they're not like it's not like 70, 80, 90 percent, which you get this threshold also of participation, where then you get into real questions about why are so many people voting and who are they voting for? And autocrats often have 90 percent voter turnout, but like, like you know, so yeah, it's an interesting question. So I guess the reason I ask is because um like who holds ECI accountable? What the voter turnout is terrible, like who holds the bag on that, or is that something? Is that even a conversation that's going to be had? And if so, is that just generate more problems? I think you saw by this kind of like larger infrastructure you're talking about. Is anybody holding account accountable? I guess what drives change? What drives change? I mean, so I mean, there's a sort of there's certainly staff generating change. The election commissioner shifted now. There's changes at that level. Um, a lot of the stuff we're talking about now, the history of the election commission begins the early like sort of activist period of the election commission occurred with this person named Tian Session in the early 90s. Um, and he's a very interesting figure. But a lot of these technologies things come back ways before that. So the election commission isn't accountable in the sense of an outside source. Um, and that's mainly because they're well liked, like I guess. Um, and the idea would be that if they are accountable to an outside source, um, then that creates an avenue for partisanship and the government of India to get into their processes. Now, there are other ways the government of India can certainly do that, and there are other ways to hold the election commission accountable. So, for example, people bring lawsuits against the election commission in India at all times, specifically around participation. Um, I just read this, read this amazing article about the election commission in the 80s and 90s and thousands progressively getting more involved in declaring, deciding citizenship status for people, mm -hmm. and the discomfort that cause when the election commission took on this responsibility of deciding citizenship status, particularly for, um, particularly in, um, but anyway, um, so there, and there was court cases filed and like they rolled back their rights and they kind of reasserted them. So there's legal processes where their power is sort of questioned and conducted, but it's also that power is because it's constitutionally mandated and interpreted. And so 
like I mean, this is a strong question for them. Like, do you have a lot of the election commission that has very little judicial oversight making its decisions about citizenship status? That becomes a really big problem, right? Um, or potential for a really big problem. Um, and I'll just say this also, like, the, one of the reasons that electronic voting technologies weren't used is that, so, the election commission can just do what they want. So, in 1982, they just decided to use them. They're like, we're going to use them now. Like, in this, like, a few conditions, the sort of contests were immediately legally challenged by the candidates that lost. They won the challenges of the Supreme Court based on the fact that the Supreme Court, basically, that the election law of India doesn't specifically say, so specifically, you have to use a ballot box. And there's no wiggle room for legal interpretation. But the really fascinating part about that is that if you look at what happened, is so let's just say they lost by 1,200 votes. The party that lost lost by 1,200 votes. When the decision was overturned, they won by 1,200 votes. Um, and so it really speaks to this sort of interesting like, political cultural battle over sort of electoral legitimacy. But there's certainly legal mechanisms, but it's a very, it's a vast and intense set of issues. Just a final thought too, as far as another book that may be helpful for you, um, it's called This Program is, bought, is Brought to You by, dot, dot, dot. It's by Joshua Braun, and it's about distributing television news online, but it's helpful, I think, for this project in that uh, he really smartly, he's actually a Charlton Gillespie student at Cornell, but he really smartly synthesizes science and technology studies, uh, ideas about heterogeneous engineering, and so on, to try to explain how, kind of, taking that and bringing it to media sociology, and sort of bringing it to media and communication. Because I, I think early on you talked about wanting to talk about this as a, me as, as a type of media, right? And then we didn't quite come back to that, but I think, yeah. so to the extent that you want to bring this to issues of communication and media communication studies, I think his book may illustrate some, of course, what he's looking at television naturally sits within that space, but there's still a kind of um, issue of linking STS and COM in a, in a productive way, and I think that that, you know, that, that makes sense. Yeah. It's, it's interesting because the person I was talking to about the public confidence thing was Charlton Gillespie okay. in Boston. And yeah. That even was specifically around like, how do you make this, uh, how do you get to this communications point? So, so thank you. All right. Pretty good. Thank you. Thank you.
I don't like the setup. Me? Don't look at me. I didn't have anything to do with the change of this. I like, I like the way it goes. So like Thursday? I, I teach, I teach. <laughs>